Um, I, I just have a few slides uh, that I can talk about, um, but I much prefer to have a conversation and questions and answers. So if there are questions you have or topics you'd like to explore in depth, uh, please feel free to interrupt me uh, and we'll dig into them. Um, because frankly, you probably don't want to just listen to more slides, you probably want to find out stuff, and, and I don't know that my slides will necessarily talk about everything you want to find out about. Uh, so today we're going to talk about rebar. Um, the goals, uh, I, I guess, for this talk are to uh, talk a little bit about the common patterns for organizing uh, applications and releases uh, with rebar, uh, and talk a little bit about the trade-offs. Um, so this is, as a topic, I mean, I could show you how to use rebar and rebar unit and compile and all that stuff. There's a tutorial on Wednesday where I will do that. Um, but right now, what I wanted to talk about was just how do we structure our sor uh, the, the source code and the directory structure in a way that works for the different sort of types of projects that we have. We'll look at some code. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I still have an aversion to saying too long in PowerPoint, so I, I try to get back to the terminal where I feel more comfortable. Um, so we'll talk about these different uh, structures and uh, just sort of see where the conversation takes us. Does that sound okay? Interesting? All right. No, all right. No one's throwing tomatoes, so we're, we're in good shape. Uh, so first, a little terminology. Um, and the funny thing is, is that th this, this is in the OTP documentation, um, but I don't know that uh, everybody knows these things. Certainly, um, it was, I guess, a full year or more um, before I was working with OTP to the point where I actually learned these terms. So I want to start with these because they give us sort of a, a place to, to start from. Uh, so first off, application. So that is one or many Erlang modules, uh, and then a resource file, a .apt file, typically, um, that goes in the eBIN directory uh, that describes stuff about that application. Um, so that's, most people have worked with applications at some level. Uh, everything, a, a lot of the functionality that comes with an Erlang release, um, there's an observer module, uh, there's, uh, or, or applications, um, a lot of the applications that come with, or a lot of the functionality that comes with the Erlang release is actually individual applications. They're just sort of prepackaged. So when you write code, typically you construct an application where you group all of your modules together. Okay, so that's easy enough. But then what's a release? Um, in other sort of systems, uh, a release would sort of encompass more than, than just working code, it would also typically encompass a, a runtime. That's not the case with Erlang. Uh, a release is actually a series of applications and then a release file, which describes how to start those applications, ordering, environmental variables, stuff like that. Um, and this is actually, the release is, I would guess, uh, one of the most powerful concepts that come with Erlang, but is also one of the least understood uh, because it's still pretty hard to work with. Now, there's, we've gotten a lot better recently. We've got RHEL tool that makes things a lot easier. Uh, I know Ulf uh, <coughs> here, um, has been uh, also working on some uh, other ways to, to generate release files as well. Um, but one of the things that Rebar does is it wraps RHEL tool and makes it easier to generate a release. Uh, and then finally, we have a system, um, which is in the documentation called a target system, but that's typically a release plus your embedded Earths version. Um, now, some people don't ship ERTs uh, as part of, or, or the runtime system as part of their, as, <laughs> as part of their release. It's all very overloaded. Um, but uh, most people who build the product do, because that way you have a self-contained directory you can just copy over to your target machine and just, you have Erlang ready to go. Any questions so far? This is sort of just laying the foundation. So. A side trip, and there's about three rabbit holes, which means that about half my slides are rabbit holes, but that's okay. It's, it's going to be fun rabbit holes, I think. Uh, how rebar works. Um, you need to understand how all the pieces fit together to, to sort of come along down the, uh, the directory structure pole or, 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 or rabbit hole. Um, there are, basically rebar has three what I call module chains, or just lit chains, list of modules that get run. So when you say rebar compile, Rebar looks at the current directory and says, is this an app directory? Is this a release directory? Or is it just some other sort of directory I don't know about? So to test for an app directory, 
sorry, shaking the projector here or something. Um, an app directory test just looks in the eBin directory for anything that ends in .app, which is a very, it's, it's sort of the, the old school, the traditional way of defining uh, an application. Or a sort of more recent thing based off of user feedback, because it wasn't in rebar originally, because that's like, yeah, everybody needs to write an app file, it's not that hard. Uh, and then people were like, no, actually it is that hard, please don't make us do that. Uh, so a more recent innovation, uh, thanks to Rebar users, is the ability to define an app.source file which gets turned in at runtime or at compilation time to a .app for you. And that basically just builds a list of all the modules. So it makes it a little bit easier. So if you run Rebar compile and it looks at the current directory and it says, oh, there's an app file in eBin or there's an app source file in source, then it runs all of the modules associated with an app. Um, and so in the same way, if it looks in the current directory and sees that there's a file called rel tool config, it treats that directory as a release. And that means that different functionality uh, actually gets run. So it runs first the modules for the current directory type, so app or rel, and then it goes on and runs the any module. So let's jump out to a terminal real quick. Uh, if I can get my focus back. Uh, so if we look at rebar, and we look at rebars, app file, uh, we can see that, for instance, with app dir here, we can see that when you type, for instance, compile, and you're in an application directory, it's going to run all of these modules, it's going to run the compile function on all of these modules in a row, in that order. And then it's going to go to the any dir modules and run those. It's really pretty simple and actually quite stupid. Um, and I, I mean that in sort of a bad way. It's, it's a great for writing a, a build tool, but it's, it's horrible for sort of predictability. And this is one of the areas where uh, we've already seen a lot better. Any questions so far about what's going on here? All right. Either everybody knows all of this stuff uh, or I'm, yeah. All right, so that's how rebar works. Um, oh, uh, I sh I'm sorry, I should show you the, so in the relder, we can see that there's a couple, there's, uh, far fewer modules, but one of them is, is up, uh, generating app, app upgrades, one that invokes your all tool, and one that actually does upgrades. Um, so anyway, moving on. Uh, so now we know how rebar works. It's going to look at the sort of context of the directory that you're in, and then compile whatever's in there accordingly. Um, it's one of those choices where, at the time, it seems like a great idea, and it still seems like a good idea later, but you sort of wonder what you were thinking when you did it as well. So it's, I don't know, I have a lot of um, uh, mixed emotions about this, this design choice. Other helper bits that Rebar does for you. Um, and, and this is all sort of going back to, you have to know what Rebar can do for you, and then we can talk about directory structure and why that makes sense. So Rebar has this idea of dependencies. Now, let me say, first off, the dependencies and the way Rebar does it is a contentious subject. Um, and that's, uh, yes, uh, dependencies are just a contentious subject. Some people would like pre-compiled dependencies, other people want their dependencies from source, like Rebar does. Um, either way is good, but Rebar does it this way because this is what we needed at the time. So uh, please don't misunderstand me, this is not a religious feeling for me, this is just sort of the way that it is because this is what I needed. But if you have ideas about how to do dependencies better, uh, I would love to see some pull requests for that. Um, so, I, I, competing ideas are, are not a bad thing. Um, in fact, they make the product much better. So, Rebar can, um, generating some sort of weird field here, uh, Rebar can actually download source um, and compile it for you. So, you can declare, uh, so, so one application can say in the Rebar config, I want to depend on this other application, and Rebar will go out and download that application for you from a, from a Git repo, from a Mercurial, et cetera and compile both of those so that you have a very crude form of dependencies, but it's, a, it, it's done in a way that allows you to have isolation over your environment. Uh, so an example in the rebar config file, something is really wrong with this plug here. Um, in the rebar config file, uh, you can just declare apps and then the app name that you want, or depths, app name that you want, uh, what type of dependency it is, so there's a get what the git URL is and a tag uh, for the git dependency. And you can define a bunch of these. Uh, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, actually, let's just look at it now. Uh, so if we go to, to React KV uh, and look at its config file, 
you can actually see that the depths here, it's got a whole mess of them. Um, and what's interesting about this is that this is not the, ex this is the top level dependencies. Those apps in turn can be dependent on other apps. And it actually pulls down all the other apps as well, which is great and awful at the same time. Okay? I don't know if you're picking up a theme here, but there's a lot of things about build tools that you will always love and hate. Uh, build tools are a necessary evil, um, and, but they are also wonderful when they work well. And, and being the author of a build tool, those emotions are even stronger because you, you love it and you hate it at the same time. Um, so in this case, Rebar will go out and get React Core. It says that I want any version of it. So uh, it's, a, it's a regex, which is a simple way of doing uh, version checking. Pull it from Git and pull it from master, which is the, the branch in Git. And then, so what Rebar will do is it'll go through all of these, get that repo, and then examine its Rebar config and resolve it recursively. Um, it doesn't do a DAG or anything, a, a directed graph or anything like that, like it probably ought to. Um, but it's one of those things where the simple approach works for 90% of the cases, so he said, good, we will keep it simple. Um, so that's dependencies, and that's Rebar provides that facility. Um, also, Rebar provides some helper stuff uh, to invoke rel tool for you. Um, rel tool is a great tool. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Does that mean you intend to keep it that way? So, uh, I've started rewriting Rebar uh, two or three times now, uh, and every time I've been dependency slightly differently. Um, and actually, the version of Rebar that most people use is version 5 uh, <laughs> that, that I iterated through. Um, and, and I'm probably like starting from scratch because it just didn't work before. Um, so, long answer, uh, or short answer, is that uh, for the time being, because I haven't found a better way yet. Um, I'm open to other ideas, though. I'm open to having other dependency mechanisms, but this is the one that works reliably and works for most people. Like, I've seen a number of other people be able to use it. Is it the best answer? I, I don't know, but it's a working answer. And that's sort of the important thing at this point. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, when we switched over to Rebar, uh, for, uh, our main application, we had problems that we had to basically order everything in a very specific Order. Mm. Otherwise, it will put one dependency, but web machine needed some special version of React. Yes. And that was very complicated. Yes, it is very complicated. Uh, and we need to do better on that. But, yeah. That's the way it works. Yeah, it's the way it works right now. Um, I, yeah, so one of the things that most people sort of find out the hard way is that React's dependent, or React, uh, it's only five in the morning. Uh, Rebar's, Rebar's dependency resolver um, basically just, it just recursively walks through all the dependencies and tries, it doesn't sort of try and figure out whether or not two, <coughs> two dependencies might depend on a third dependency on a different version. It doesn't allow you to do that. It assumes that if you are declaring a dependency and somebody else is declaring it, that you're both okay using that version. Now, you can control that or tweak it really using the regexes. But most people just use star for, right, for, for their version checks, so it doesn't really work as you might expect it to. Yeah. It, it is a regex, uh, because the, the versioning is uh, sort of highly variable uh, in terms of third-party apps. So the Erlang apps are pretty consistent, generally, um, or the stuff that ships is part of Erlang. But, but everybody else's apps right now are just very variable, like some people will version it fade or whatever, and so you can't really do, write a parser because you don't know if everyone's going to follow the same s standard. Um, I have another question, because uh, what does the minus J flag do today? Uh, so that controls how big the compilation pool is. But that's just within one app, isn't it? Because it's not like the main J that just goes fully parallel. Because it's still kind of sequential. It, it is. Well, so, so there's a pool of workers for compilation where it will, but, it, but, it's, but it's not compiling apps. Right. It does one app at a time. So it'll speed up one app if you have more processors. Although three, I've done some testing and three seems to be the best number for disk I.O. and all other stuff balancing out. Okay. Any other questions? All right, we'll keep moving. Uh, so Rebar can also uh, automatically generate a release. 
uh, and assistant from config file, um, and um, Rebar just wraps RHEL tool and, and provides a convention for using it. Um, when RHEL tool first came out, uh, it was, it still is pretty opaque uh, in terms of how to invoke it. Uh, I think it was really, I don't know, is the person who wrote RHEL tool in here that I could maybe just ask this? Now they really won't stand up. Uh, <laughs> no, so, so one of the things with RHEL tool is that uh, it, it, it used to be uh, my first incarnation of Rebar, uh, which actually started as Ruby scripts, which was a bad idea, um, actually uh, did all the stuff that Roll Tool does. And it's, it's a lot of stuff to package up the apps and generate the release file and untar it and retar it and so forth. Uh, so Roll Tool is great, but uh, invoking it, I think it was meant to be invoked from a graphical interface, so there are command line stuff and functions you can invoke. It's really clear to people when Roll Tool is first released, and I don't think it still is, how to go about using it. Uh, so Rebar provides a wrapper for it to make it a little more user-friendly. Uh, this is still, to be honest, RHEL tool uh, is, is one of the areas where I get the most questions uh, still today. And that's like, well, you gotta go talk to the RHEL tool people because I don't know the answer to that one. So anyway, uh, Rebar makes it a little easier. Uh, so a bit of philosophy about depths. Um, is that apps should be compiled from source. So this is my philosophy. Again, this is not a religious thing for me. This is just sort of my philosophy and, and things that can change. But my philosophy uh, affects Rebar. Uh, so this is sort of uh, why I wanted to talk about it. Um, so generally, uh, I work for a company called Basho, and we make React, which is a, which is a, a, a database in Erlang. Uh, so we ship that. We ship binaries and, and the source as well. It's open source. Um, but we want to, when you ship a product, you want to know exactly what versions of things are, are included. And uh, all the way down to the Earth's thing. And the, and the release stuff in Erlang makes that very, very feasible. Um, but when you're compiling it, you want isolation of your dependencies. So uh, the, the stance Rebar took was that uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, um, everything is correct for a given platform in Earth's version. Uh, in other words, if you don't want a dependency that someone else compiled on a different platform because you don't know what compilation flags they used, etc. Um, and so that that really requires you to, to download stuff and compile it from source. It's a little bit more work, but Erlang compiles really fast to start with. Um, so it's a little more work that I'm, I'm going to give. Um, and then secondly, part of the philosophy of rebar and the dependency stuff is that there should be no central repo of apps. Now, a lot of people complain about this because they can't find apps, which is a good complaint. Um, so, so that's that's sort of uh, that's sort of the, the downside is that curation isn't provided. But the upside is that curation is not required. Nobody has to do all that work of packaging stuff. Everybody, you get a much more sort of decentralized development of a bunch of libraries, which is is great and bad at the same time. Um, th there's just <laughs> There is no perfect build tool. Uh, you know, some people still prefer Make. Uh, that's that's fine. Um, and, and Rebar has to make some trade off somewhere. So um, the, these are sort of things that guided how Rebar works. So uh, all of this is just setting us up to talk about now a simple app. Um, so generally, a simple Erlang app is just one app, uh, and it has a directory structure where the Erlang source is in source. We compile beam files go in eBIM. If you have any public include files, they go in include. Um, other stuff goes in priv, and any C stuff goes in C source. Pretty straightforward. Um, it may have depths in rebar config, and here are some examples. Cowboy, Gproc, Folsom. Uh, so if we go and we look at one, uh, let's see what I got on here. Cowboy. Right, we can see that Cowboy has uh, a source directory, it's got uh, an include directory, and it's got ebin. Uh, and I I think it's using the app source, right? So normally an app file requires you to list all the modules in your app. Because they're using the .app.source extension, Rebar will automatically take this file, parse it, insert all the modules it compiles, and put that out into a .app file for you. But it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. This is the, and, and really this is, an app convention is what everybody uses. This is, yeah, who's not familiar with sort of this convention of structuring an app. So I don't want to berate you with all the advantages. All right, so let's move on. Uh, this is how most things are structured in most libraries. 
a newer sort of form that's e emerged, um, and I'm starting to see it more and more. I think uh, Agnes <coughs> is this, rebar itself is this way, uh, Bachelor Bench is this way, and I, from the e-script, which unfortunately won't work. You have to have, because of the way dynamic linking works on most operating systems, you have to have an actual file on the file system, which, so typically .so's are in priv, uh, but you can't just load it from an, a zip archive. So I, I've been thinking about adding a way to automatically copy .so files to a temp directory and load it that way to make it a little bit easier, but I'm not quite sure how to automate that through a general case. So, But that's the only thing that normally goes in priv. Um, now, technically, um, so it doesn't work right now with the way rebar descriptizes stuff, but it's possible with an e-script, uh, and, and actually rebar does this, so uh, we can look at that real quick. Uh, if you unzip rebar, uh, oh, that's why I was doing that. Um, yeah, that's better. So you can actually see that rebar, as packaged up, does use a proof. So if you're careful, uh, then then you can put stuff in priv and and read it with with the rebar code. Yeah, but just a comment because one thing I noticed with rebar is if, if 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 you import something, you make your own one, um, and you use to get dependencies. You decide where it goes in the file system. So it's a continual current directory where yes. it has to be. Yeah. And I found it very helpful to put it under to make a, a directory called slash home joe dot rebar. Mm. That's where you put everything when you install it. So there's no doubt about that. So if everybody did that. So, so, <laughs> so it's a double-edged sword, and this is where we sort of go off into the dependency, how to do dependencies. I mean, you could actually do that right now with rebar. Uh, there, That's you can. Oh, okay. So you use like a dot rebar dot config file. Yeah. Okay, and that that and globally. Like yeah. 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 That's one way of doing it. I for for our use case at Basho, that wouldn't work, but. I, like I said, dependencies is one of those things where you know different people want to do it different ways, and oh, it's because different people can put them in their file systems in different places. Yes, so if they put it relative to the home directory, it's fixed path so it's all easier. It is easier, but then you lose isolation of versions. So that's no, if you did it by end, yeah. If we, if we did it right, you're right. If we if we did it different. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, <laughs> you have to change the app thing. Yes. Yes, the app, yeah, the app structure would have changed. All right, so, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't mean to sort of gloss over it, but dependency, yeah, anyway. Um, so this is an e-scripted app, uh, and it's it's a pretty useful sort of way to go about structuring things. Uh, everybody with me so far? Useful topic? Good so far? Don't see too many people asleep. All right, <laughs> we'll keep going. Uh, so a composite app. This is the one, this is the one where so many people start out this way, and it's really, it can work if you're really careful, but it's sort of like walking around with a gun pointed at your toe and hoping you don't accidentally pull the trigger. Um, it's, <laughs> you can do it, but it's just not a good idea. Um, so typically in a composite app, you're going to have an apps directory with all of your apps inside of it. You may still have dependencies, and then you also have a rel tool config in a subdirectory. So, for, uh, for today's uh, demo, I went ahead and constructed one of those, uh, if I can find it, so test that. So if I just do a flat, uh, yeah. yeah. All right, so if we do a find on this directory. So you can see here, I've got an app subdirectory with app one and app two, and this is my code. And then I've got a release subdirectory with the important one being rel tool config, all these other things are template files. Um, this is actually the way that React was structured for a while. So all of the React, React Core, React KB, all of those things were in as a, a subdirectory, and then there was the release subdirectory. Uh, first, the first mistake that a lot of people make is they put rel tool config at the top level. Don't do that. Do it under a specific directory. The, the, the rel and rel tool config file, if, if you don't, have that in its own directory, and, and you really want that tag separately as well, things get really funky. So you can do this, and if you're gonna do this composite app, this is how I recommend you do it. You don't have, make sure rel tools, in, 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 a rel tool config is in its own sub subdirectory, um, but you have to do some weird stuff. For instance, look at rel, rel tool config. We have to do this libdirs stuff. That right there, libdirs, 
scary directive because it includes, what that is essentially saying is for everything under the apps directory, find all of the early apps you can possibly find and include them on the path. Which is fine when you use it right, but when you point it at a directory too high up, so for instance, if I pointed that at my source directory by accident, in other words, I miscounted references, that would say add all of these apps right here onto my code path. And those aren't, might not even be the versions that you want. So you have to be really careful about sort of structuring things this way, because you have to use that lifters directive to move on. Does that make sense? I know it's sort of a disjointed, uh, 10 minutes already. All right, all right uh, we'll keep moving. Um, so composite apps, um, you can do it that way, but I don't really recommend you do it that way. Can we see the, the rework config for that? Uh, sure. Uh, where was I? I test that. It's pretty simple. Uh, you specify <laughs> subters and uh, and the release. But order is important, as always, because it's a list. So don't put the release first because it'll do all sorts of weird, it'll give you completely unrelated errors because you can't find it out. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, so uh, package system is sort of my recommended way. If you are constructing a, a full system uh, in the OTP terminology, in other words, embedded herbs and a series of applications and a release, this is really how you want to do it. There's not actually any apps in the repo. All apps are just declared as dependencies. So Rebar will go out and get those apps, compile them all with the same version of Erts and the version of Erts you're going to package, and ensure that everything is consistent. Uh, a rel tool config in a subdirectory, never, ever put a rel tool config not in a sort of dedicated subdirectory. Um, and for down example, and, and, so does anyone know of other app people sort of using this style of packaging besides React? Or are we like the only ones? Okay, well, at least we're not the only ones. I, uh, so, so that's great. <laughs> so uh, if, we, if we look at uh, React real quick, um, we can see that there is just a depth directory with all the depths that we're going to need. There's a rel directory. Uh, and then the rebar config is a little bit scary because of all the, all the depths. Uh, but the sub is just rel. So anything you run uh, will be sort of as dependencies. Any questions on this setup? Uh, no, we can't. Yeah. I think someone submitted, did you submit a PR for it? Yeah. Uh, it hasn't been merged yet. But I saw the PR and I... Oh, no, I, I submitted Okay, somebody, I, I believe someone, well, or maybe you filed the issue. I can't, you know, I get how many said. I, I know someone was talking about that earlier. Uh, okay, uh, moving on. The future, I am. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah. So the great thing about the great thing about Rebar being an open source project uh, is that we've actually gotten a lot of contributors. I think uh, at the first Erlang uh, factory that I presented on Rebar, we had over 70 contributors uh, after the first year. So 70 people took time to write code to go into this build system. Um, I, I suspect that <laughs> I suspect that we will wind up rewriting Rebar at some point. Um, to to sort of solve some of these problems with dependencies, to support more exotic dependency setups, better dependency checking, and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm sort of a pragmatic guy, so it's very hard for me to say, yes, let's rewrite it and make it better, uh, when it means that, you know, the stuff that's already working, like that stuff has to keep working too. So how do you sort of satisfy both requirements? Um, so I, I don't quite know what the future holds. We're going to continue accepting pull requests. If we write a new version of Rebar, it will be backwards compatible, and it will just be drop-in. Um, but hopefully it would just be more of a structural overhaul um, to, to improve dependency management in particular. Because that's, I get a lot of questions, well, it, dependency management and rel tool, those are sort of the big things that I get a lot of questions on. Any questions? Because that's all the slides I got. Joe? Um, well, I was just wondering, if you think about future directions, because do you have any plans to make them? It's like 80% of them already. It's, it, you know, you can't sign. If I was looking at, say, no, no package manager, which seems to be very well designed, because the, the two big changes you can make are the directory structure, and you can find them, yeah. you can make the versions. And then the manifest file, I just haven't got enough stuff in it. So the app file is basically a manifest file, but it doesn't have this config, descriptor, and all that stuff. If you make that declarative, 
about signing and pushing as well. You've got the self order. Right. Yes. And you've got one, you've got this sort of acceptance. Because we've had two package managers over the fighting with each other. Yeah, it's exactly the same one. Yeah, so it, it's, I it's close. To in that direction. What I would like Rebar to, to do, and I know you're going to be yelling at me in a minute, right? We're, it's almost time, right? Five minutes. Five minutes, all right. So uh, from a vision perspective, I, I would prefer almost not to make that choice. What I would rather do is use sort of the adoption of Rebar. I want to figure out a better way to, to structure Rebar as a framework. Rebar's always been a framework. Rebar is just a big list of modules, like I said at the beginning, that get invoked in order. I think with a slightly better structure, internal structure, Rebar could provide tools, where one of the tools is compilation, the other tool is dependency management. And, and, and maybe we have a couple of variations of dependency management. You see, in a way, the thing I like is the, the dependencies. Mm. The thing I don't like is when you yank them over, you then unpack them. I mean, they should, you're breaking the structure. Just leave them sort of the blobs. It, it's, it's very nice. Yeah, I guess to, to waffle a little bit, I just don't. I've gotten sort of a lot of mixed signals because some people say I want binary packages, other people say I want source packages. Source packages are. Oh, I don't care if the source in the blob. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't, 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 Let me think on that one. I, I could see Rebar doing something like that. Um, but I don't know. At, at the end of the day, I think the first step towards doing that will be improving the structure of Rebar. And then from that, we can sort of look at these other sort of next steps. Um, so just out of curiosity, since I've got you here, and you can't really run out now, <laughs> it's the end of the talk, uh, what, how many people in here are using DEPs sort of as they are? Just by a show of hands. Wow, okay, so a fair number of them. Um, is that something that's generally caused pain? Is that, is that something that needs to be asked? All right, so it's, it's worked for some people, but not for others, interesting. The problem is I already have much web in the, in the tree, and I put it in separately from snapshot, and suddenly I want to use something in Rebar, and it's pulling up the web in the end, so I take all that stuff out, and then you've got two sets of trees, it's like, oh, yeah. Um, you kind of don't want to replace your entire, you don't get some random version of something when you've got the production system you've tested. This is always a bit scary, style version. What's going to smash? Okay. Uh, so Quanter, we're running into a similar problem where uh, we're re architecting most of our applications, and um, so there's this question of um, do you want a flat dependency file at the top, or mm -hmm. really should each thing be self-contained? When you're making self-contained, you really what it is logically there are these dependency trees, uh, and then they overlap, and then you have issues where um, are things incompatible? Have you made them incompatible because you explicitly wrote the version in the version check instead of the regex? Uh, have you made them incompatible because oh, the patch should be incompatible even early and uh, things like that. So it's really there's a lot of uh, you know, fiddling around with your configs, making sure they run the right order. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a certain uh, amount of wishing you had something like you know a data house or something that sort of manipulate the tree. All right. Uh, yeah. And so when when you're uh, grabbing a bunch of separate things, you know, you're grabbing uh, web machine and uh, React and things like that, and you they're mostly separate. Not so bad, but when it says, okay, here's a business, business logic, and the right tree for this overlaps a lot with that tree, right. and you get four or five of them stacking, and, uh, and it becomes pretty silly in this game now. All right, well, I guess I know where I need to do some hacking. <laughs> but if you have a pull request you want to submit, I would encourage it. <laughs> all right, so that's all I got. Uh, any other questions? All right, thank you all for coming.